The Cultural and Spiritual Legacy of Fiat Inflation by Guido Holzman from his book The Ethics of Money Production, Chapter 13. 1. Inflation Habits The notion that inflation is harmful is a staple of economic science. But most textbooks underrate the extent of the harm because they define inflation much too narrowly as a lasting decrease of the purchasing power of money, PPM, and also because they pay scant attention to the concrete forms of inflation. To appreciate the disruptive nature of inflation in its full extent, we must keep in mind that it springs from a violation of the fundamental rules of society. Inflation is what happens when people increase the money supply by fraud, imposition, and breach of contract. Invariably, it produces three characteristic consequences. One, it benefits the perpetrators at the expense of all other money users. Two, it allows the accumulation of debt beyond the level debts could reach on the free market, and three, it reduces the PPM below the level it would have reached on the free market. While these three consequences are bad enough, things get much worse once inflation is encouraged and promoted by the state. The government's fiat makes inflation perennial, and as a result, we observe the formation of inflation-specific institutions, and habits. Thus, fiat inflation leaves a characteristic cultural and spiritual stain on human society. In the present chapter, we'll take a closer look at some aspects of this legacy. 2. Hyper-centralized government. Inflation benefits the government that controls it not only at the expense of the population at large, but also at the expense of all secondary and tertiary governments. It is a well-known fact that the European kings, during the rise of their nation-states in the 17th and 18th centuries, crushed the major vestiges of intermediate power. The democratic nation-states of the 19th and 20th centuries completed the centralization of power that had been begun under the kings. The economic driving force of this process was inflation, which at that point was entirely in the hands of the central state apparatus. More than any other economic reason, it made the nation-state irresistible, and thus it contributed, indirectly at least, to the popularity of nationalistic ideologies, which in the 20th century ushered in a frenetic worshipping of the nation-state. Inflation spurs the growth of central governments. It allows these governments to grow larger than they could become in a free society. And it allows them to monopolize governmental functions to an extent that would not occur under a natural production of money. This comes at the expense of all forms of intermediate government and, of course, at the expense of civil society at large. The inflation-sponsored centralization of power turns the average citizen more and more into an isolated social atom. All of his social bonds are controlled by the central state, which also provides most of the services that formerly were provided by other social entities, such as family and local government. At the same time, the central direction of the state apparatus is removed from the daily life of its wards. It is difficult to reconcile these trends with the goal of a well-ordered society. In the 19th century, the French sociologist Frédéric Laplay, an astute and critical observer of the centralization of state power, established the moral principle of subsidiarity according to which any problem should be solved by the, in political terms, lowest-ranking person or organization that is able to solve it. Leo XIII then canonized this principle, in a manner of speaking, in Reum Novarum, without calling it by its name. Only in 1931, 
Pope Pius XI adopted the expression subsidiarity in his encyclical Quadragesimo Anno. But moral precepts will not stop a trend that springs from such powerful sources. The evil has to be attacked at the root. 3. Fiat Inflation and War Among the most gruesome consequences of fiat money, and of paper money in particular, is its ability to extend the length of wars. The destructions of war have the healthy effect of cooling down initial war frenzies. The more protracted and destructive a war becomes, therefore, the less is the population inclined to support it financially through taxes and the purchase of public bonds. Fiat inflation allows the government to ignore the fiscal resistance of its citizens and to maintain the war effort on its present level or even to increase that level. The government just prints the notes it needs to buy cannons and boots. According to Kant, world peace presupposed that public debt not be used to finance war since this would unduly facilitate the waging of war. However, the prohibition of a particular use of public debt is unlikely to be effective in practice because it is impossible to tie up a particular type of revenue with a particular type of expenditure. The government can always claim that it pays for military expenditure with revenue from taxes, whereas the public debt is used for non-military purposes. It is, therefore, more effective to attack the problem at its root and to abolish the legal dispositions that impose fractional reserve banking and paper money. The reduction of the public debt would be a logical consequence. This is exactly what happened in the two world wars of the 20th century, at least in the case of the European states. The governments of France, Germany, Italy, Russia, and the United Kingdom covered a large part of their expenses through inflation. It is, of course, difficult to evaluate any precise quantitative impact, but it is not unreasonable to assume that fiat inflation prolonged both wars by many months or even one or two years. If we consider that the killings reached their climax toward the end of the war, we must assume that many millions of lives could have been saved. Many people believe that, in war, all means are just. In their eyes, fiat inflation is legitimate as a means to fend off lethal threats to a nation. But this argument is rather defective. It is not the case that all means are just in a war. There is in Catholic theology a theory of just war, which stresses exactly this point. Fiat inflation would certainly be illegitimate if less offensive means were available to attain the same end. And fact is that such means exist and have always been at the disposition of governments, for example, credit money and additional taxation. Another typical line of defense of fiat money in war times is that the government might know better than the citizens just how near victory is at hand. The ignorant population grows weary of the war and tends to resist additional taxation. But the government is perfectly acquainted with the situation. Without fiat money, its hands would be tied, with potentially disastrous consequences. The inflation just gives it the little extra, something needed to win. It is, of course, conceivable that the government is better informed than its citizens, but it is difficult to see why this should be an obstacle in war finance. The most essential task of political leadership is to rally the masses behind its cause. Why should it be impossible for a government to spread its better information, thus convincing the populace of the need for additional taxes? This brings us to the following consideration. 4. Inflation and Tyranny War is only the most extreme case in which fiat inflation allows governments to pursue their goals without genuine support from their citizens. The printing press allows the government to tap the property of its people without having obtained their consent, and in fact against their wishes. 
What kind of government is it that arbitrarily takes the property of its citizens? Aristotle and many other political philosophers have called it tyranny. And monetary theorists, from Oresme to Mises, have pointed out that fiat inflation, considered as a tool of government finance, is the financial technique characteristic of tyranny. Five, race to the bottom in monetary organization. As we have seen in some detail, fiat inflation is an inherently unstable way of producing money because it turns moral hazard and irresponsibility into an institution. The results are frequently recurring economic crises. Past efforts to repair these unwelcome effects, yet without questioning the principle of fiat inflation per se, have entailed a peculiar evolution of monetary institutions, a kind of institutional race to the bottom. This does not, of course, imply a quick process. The devolution of monetary institutions has been underway for centuries, and it has still not quite reached the absolute bottom, even though the process has accelerated considerably in our age of paper money. We have dealt with this phenomenon already at some length and will present it in greater historical context in Part 3. 6. Business under fiat inflation Fiat inflation has a profound impact on corporate finance. It makes liabilities, credit, cheaper than they would be on a free market. This prompts entrepreneurs to finance their ventures to a greater extent than otherwise through credit rather than through equity, the capital brought into the firm by its owners. In a natural system of money production, banks would grant credit only as financial intermediaries. That is, they could lend out only those sums of money that they had either saved themselves or which other people had saved and then lent to the banks. The bankers would, of course, be free to grant credit under any terms, interest, securities, duration, they like, but it would be suicidal for them to offer better terms than those that their own creditors had granted them. For example, if a bank receives a credit at 5%, it would be suicidal for it to lend this money at 4%. It follows that on a free market, profitable banking is constrained within fairly narrow limits, which in turn are determined by the savers. It is not possible for a bank to stay in business and to offer better terms than the savers who are most ready to part with their money for some time. But fractional reserve banks can do precisely that. Since they can produce additional bank credit at virtually zero cost, They can grant credit at rates that are lower than the rates that would otherwise have prevailed. And the beneficiaries will therefore finance some ventures through debts that they would otherwise have financed with their own money, or which they would not have started at all. Paper money has very much the same effect, but in a far greater magnitude. A paper money producer can grant credit to virtually any extent, and on virtually any terms. In the past few years, the Bank of Japan has offered credit at 0% interest, and then proceeded in some cases to actually pay people for borrowing its credit. It is obvious that few firms can afford to resist such offers. Competition is fierce in most industries, and the firms must seek to use the best terms available, lest they lose that competitive edge that can be decisive for profits and also for mere survival. It follows that fiat inflation makes business more dependent on banks than they otherwise would be. It creates greater hierarchy and central decision-making power than would exist on the free market. The entrepreneur who operates with 10% equity and 90% debt is not really an entrepreneur anymore. His creditors, usually bankers, are the true entrepreneurs who make all essential decisions. He is just a more or less well-paid executive, a manager. Thus, fiat inflation reduces the number of true entrepreneurs 
independent men who operate with their own money. Such men still exist in astonishing numbers, but they can only survive because their superior talents match the inferior financial terms with which they have to cope. They must be more innovative and work harder than their competitors. They know the price of independence and they are ready to pay it. Usually they are more attached to the family business and care more for their employees than the puppets of bankers. Because credit springing from fiat inflation provides an easy financial edge, they have the tendency to encourage reckless behavior of the chief executives. The intimate connection between such recklessness and the prevailing monetary system is usually overlooked, even in penetrating studies of the subject. This is especially the case with managers of large corporations who have easy access to the capital markets. Their recklessness is often confused with innovativeness. Indeed, the economist Joseph Schumpeter has famously characterized fractional reserve banks as being some sort of mainspring of economic development. He argued that such banks may use their ability to create credit out of thin air, ex nihilo, to provide funding for innovative entrepreneurs. It is conceivable that in some cases they played this role, but the odds are overwhelmingly on the other side. As a general rule, any new product and any thoroughgoing innovation in business organization is a threat for banks because they are already more or less heavily invested in established companies which produce the old products and use the old forms of organization. They have, therefore, every incentive to either prevent the innovation by declining to finance it or to communicate the new ideas to their existing partners in the business world. Thus, fractional reserve banking makes business more conservative than it otherwise would be. It benefits the established firms at the expense of innovative newcomers. Innovation is much more likely to come from independent businessmen, especially if the income taxation is low. 7. The debt yoke. Some of the foregoing considerations also apply outside of the business world. Fiat inflation provides easy credit not only to governments and firms, but also to private persons. The mere fact that such credit is offered at all incites some people to go into debt who would otherwise have chosen not to do so. But easy credit becomes nearly irresistible in connection with another typical consequence of inflation, namely the constantly rising price level. Whereas in former times the increase of prices has been barely noticeable, in our day all citizens of the Western world perceive the phenomenon. In countries such as Turkey or Brazil, where prices have increased until recently at annual rates of 80 to 100 percent, even younger people have personally experienced it. Such conditions impose a heavy penalty on cash savings. In the old days, saving was typically done in the form of hoarding gold and silver coins. It is true that such hoards did not provide any return, the metal was barren, and that they therefore did not lend themselves to the lifestyle of rentiers, but in all other respects money hoards were a reliable and effective form of saving. Their purchasing power did not just evaporate in a few decades, and in times of economic growth they even gained some purchasing power. Most importantly, they were extremely suitable for ordinary people. Carpenters, masons, tailors, and farmers are usually not very astute observers of the international capital markets. Putting some gold coins under their mattress or into a safe deposit box saved them many sleepless nights, and it made them independent of financial intermediaries. Now compare this old-time scenario with our present situation. The contrast could not be starker. It would be completely pointless in our day to hoard dollar or euro notes to prepare for retirement. 
man in his 30s who plans to retire 30 years from today, 2008, must calculate with a depreciation factor in the order of three. That is, he needs to save $3 today to have the purchasing power of one of these present-day dollars when he retires. And the estimated depreciation factor of three is rather on the low side. It follows that the rational saving strategy for him is to go into debt in order to buy assets, the price of which will increase with the inflation. This is exactly what happens today in most Western countries. As soon as young people have a job, and thus a halfway stable source of revenue, they take a mortgage to buy a house, whereas their great-grandfather might still have first accumulated savings for some 30 years and then bought his house with cash. Things are not much better for those who have already accumulated some wealth. It is true that inflation does not force them into debt, but in any case it deprives them of the possibility of holding their savings in cash. Old people with a pension fund, widows and the guardians of orphans, must invest their money into the financial markets, lest its purchasing power evaporate under their noses. Thus, they become dependent on intermediaries and on the vagaries of stock and bond pricing. It is clear that this state of affairs is very beneficial for those who derive their living from the financial markets. Stockbrokers, bond dealers, banks, mortgage corporations, and other players have reason to be thankful for the constant decline of money's purchasing power under fiat inflation. But is this state of affairs also beneficial for the average citizen? In a certain sense, his debts and Increased investment in the financial markets is beneficial for him, given our present inflationary regime. When the increase of the price level is perennial, personal debt is for him the best available strategy. But this means, of course, that without government intervention into the monetary system, other strategies would be superior. The presence of central banks and paper money make debt-based financial strategies more attractive than strategies based on prior savings. In the words of Dempsey, we might say that we have the effect of usury without the personal fault of the financial agents. The usury is institutionalized or systemic. It is not an exaggeration to say that, through their monetary policy, Western governments have pushed their citizens into a state of financial dependency unknown to any previous generation. Already in 1931, Pius XI stated, It is obvious that not only its wealth concentrated in our times, but an immense power and despotic economic dictatorship is consolidated in the hands of a few who often are not owners but only the trustees and managing directors of invested funds which they administer according to their own arbitrary will and pleasure. This dictatorship is being most forcibly exercised by those who, since they hold the money and completely control it, control credit also and rule the lending of money. Hence they regulate the flow, so to speak, of the lifeblood whereby the entire economic system lives and have so firmly in their grasp the soul, as it were, of economic life that no one can breathe against their will. One wonders which vocabulary Pius XI would have used to describe our present situation. The usual justification for this state of affairs is that it allegedly stimulates industrial development. The money hordes of former times were not only sterile, they were actually harmful from an economic point of view because they deprived business of the means of payments they needed for investments. The role of inflation is to provide these means. We have already exploded this myth in some detail. At this point, let us merely emphasize again that money hoarding does not have any negative macroeconomic implications. 
It definitely does not stifle industrial investments. Hoarding increases the purchasing power of money and thus gives greater weight to the money units that remain in circulation. All goods and services can be bought and all feasible investments can be made with these remaining units. The fundamental fact is that inflation does not bring into existence any additional resource. It merely changes the allocation of the existing resources. They no longer go to companies that are run by entrepreneurs who operate with their own money, but to business executives who run companies financed with credit. The net effect of the present surge in household debt is therefore to throw entire populations into financial dependency. The moral implications are clear. Towering debts are incompatible with financial self-reliance, and thus they tend to weaken self-reliance also in all other spheres. The debt-ridden individual eventually adopts the habit of turning to others for help rather than maturing into an economic and moral anchor of his family and of his wider community. Wishful thinking and submissiveness replace soberness and independent judgment. And what about the many cases in which families can no longer shoulder the debt load? Then the result is either despair or, alternatively, scorn for all standards of financial sanity. Eight, some spiritual casualties of fiat inflation. Fiat inflation constantly reduces the purchasing power of money. To some extent, it is possible for people to protect their savings against this trend, but this requires thorough financial knowledge, the time to constantly supervise one's investments, and a good dose of luck. People who lack one of these ingredients are likely to lose a substantial part of their assets. The savings of a lifetime often vanish into thin air during the last few years spent in retirement. The consequence is despair and the eradication of moral and social standards. But it would be wrong to infer that inflation produces this effect mainly among the elderly. As one writer observed, these effects are especially strong among the youth. They learn to live in the present and scorn those who try to teach them old-fashioned morality and thrift. Inflation thereby encourages a mentality of immediate gratification that is plainly at variance with the discipline and eternal perspective required to exercise principles of biblical stewardship, such as long-term investment for the benefit of future generations. Even those citizens who are blessed with the knowledge, time, and luck to protect the substance of their savings cannot evade inflation's harmful impact because they have to adopt habits that are at odds with moral and spiritual health. Inflation forces them to spend much more time thinking about their money than they otherwise would. We have noticed already that the old way for ordinary citizens to make savings was the accumulation of cash. Under fiat inflation, this strategy is suicidal. They must invest in assets, the value of which grows during the inflation. The most practical way to do this is to buy stocks and bonds. But this entails many hours spent on comparing and selecting appropriate issues. And it compels them to be ever watchful and concerned about their money for the rest of their lives. They need to follow the financial news and monitor the price quotations on the financial markets. Similarly, people will tend to prolong the phase of their life in which they strive to earn money, and they will place relatively greater emphasis on monetary returns than on any other criterion for choosing their profession. For example, some of those who would rather be inclined to gardening will nevertheless seek an industrial employment if the latter offers greater long-run monetary returns, and more people will accept employment far from home if it allows them to earn a little additional money than under a natural monetary system. 
the spiritual dimension of these inflation-induced habits seems obvious. Money and financial questions come to play an exaggerated role in the life of man. Inflation makes society materialistic. More and more people strive for money income at the expense of other things important for personal happiness. Inflation-induced geographical mobility artificially weakens family bonds and patriotic loyalty. Many of those who tend to be greedy, envious, and niggardly anyway fall prey to sin. Even those who are not so inclined by their natures will be exposed to temptations they would not otherwise have felt. And because the vagaries of the financial markets also provide a ready excuse for an excessively parsimonious use of one's money, donations for charitable institutions decline. Then there is the fact that perennial inflation tends to deteriorate product quality. Every seller knows that it's difficult to sell the same physical product at higher prices than in previous years, but increasing money prices are unavoidable when the money supply is subject to relentless growth. So what do sellers do? In many cases, the rescue comes through technological innovation, which allows a cheaper production of the product thus neutralizing or even overcompensating the countervailing influence of inflation. This is, for example, the case with personal computers and other products made with large inputs of information technology. But in other industries, technological progress plays a much smaller role. Here the sellers confront the above-mentioned problem. They then fabricate an inferior product and sell it under the same name, along with the euphemisms that have become customary in commercial marketing. For example, they might offer their customers light coffee and non-spicy vegetables, which translates into thin coffee and vegetables that have lost any trace of flavor. Similar product deterioration can be observed in the construction business, Countries plagued by perennial inflation seem to have a greater share of houses and streets that are in constant need of repair than other countries. In such an environment, people develop a more than sloppy attitude toward their language. If everything is whatever it is called, then it is difficult to explain the difference between truth and lie. Inflation tempts people to lie about their products, and perennial inflation encourages the habit of routine lying. We have already pointed out that routine lying plays a great role in fractional reserve banking, the basic institution of the fiat money system. Fiat inflation seems to spread this habit like a cancer over the rest of the economy. 9. Suffocating the Flame In most countries, the growth of the welfare state has been financed through the accumulation of public debt on a scale that would have been unthinkable without fiat inflation. A cursory glance at the historical record shows that the exponential growth of the welfare state, which in Europe started in the early 1970s, went hand in hand with the explosion of public debt. It is widely known that this development has been a major factor in the decline of the family, but it is commonly overlooked that the ultimate cause of this decline is fiat inflation. Perennial inflation slowly but assuredly destroys the family, thus suffocating the earthly flame of morals. Indeed, the family is the most important producer of a certain type of morals. Family life is possible only if all members endorse norms such as the legitimacy of authority and the prohibition of incest. And Christian families are based on additional precepts such as the heterosexual union between a man and woman, love of the spouses for one another and for their offspring, the respect of children for their parents, as well as belief in the reality of the triune God 
and of the truth of the Christian faith, and so forth. Parents constantly repeat, emphasize, and live these norms and precepts. Thus all family members come to accept them as the normal state of affairs. In the wider social sphere, then, these persons act as advocates of the same norms in business associations, clubs, and politics. Friends and foes of the traditional family agree on these facts. It is, among other things, because they recognize the family's effectiveness in establishing social norms that Christians seek to protect it. And it is precisely for the same reason that advocates of moral license seek to undermine it. The welfare state has been their preferred tool in the past 30 years. Today, the welfare state provides a great number of services that in former times have been provided by families, and which would, we may assume, still be provided to a large extent by families if the welfare state ceased to exist. Education of the young, care for the elderly and sick, assistance in times of emergencies, All of these services are today effectively outsourced to the state. The families have been degraded into small production units that share utility bills, cars, refrigerators, and, of course, the tax bill. The tax-financed welfare state then provides them with education and care. In many countries, it is today possible for families to deduct expenses for private care and private education from the annual tax bill, but ironically, or maybe not quite so ironically, this trend has reinforced the erosion of the family. For example, recent provisions of the U.S. tax code allow family budgets to increase through such deductions, but only if the deductible services are not provided by family members, but bought from other people. From an economic point of view, this arrangement is a pure waste of money. The fact is that the welfare state is inefficient. It provides comparatively lousy services at comparatively high cost. We need not dwell on the inability of government welfare agencies to provide the emotional and spiritual assistance that only springs from charity. Compassion cannot be bought. But the welfare state is also inefficient in purely economic terms. It operates through large bureaucracies and is therefore liable to lack incentives and economic criteria that would prevent wasting money. In the words of Pope John Paul II, by intervening directly and depriving society of its responsibility, the social assistance state leads to a loss of human energies and an inordinate increase of public agencies, which are dominated more by bureaucratic ways of thinking than by concern for serving their clients, and which are accompanied by an enormous increase in spending. In fact, it would appear that needs are best understood and satisfied by people who are closest to them and who act as neighbors to those in need. It should be added that certain kinds of demands often call for a response which is not simply material, but which is capable of perceiving the deeper human need. Everyone knows this from first-hand experience, and a great number of scientific studies drive home the same point. It is precisely because the welfare state is an inefficient economic arrangement that it must rely on taxes. If it had to compete with families on equal terms, it could not stay in business for any length of time. It has driven the family and private charities out of the welfare market because people are forced to pay for it anyway. They are forced to pay taxes, and they cannot prevent the government from floating ever new loans which absorb the capital that otherwise would be used for the production of different goods and services. The excessive welfare state of our day is an all-out direct attack on the producers of morals, but it weakens these morals also in indirect ways, most notably by subsidizing bad moral examples. The fact is that libertine lifestyles carry great economic risks. 
The welfare state socializes the cost of morally reckless behavior and therefore gives it far greater prominence than it would have in a free society. Rather than carrying an economic penalty, licentiousness might then actually go hand in hand with economic advantages because it frees the protagonist from the cost of family life. For example, the cost associated with raising children. With the backing of the welfare state, these protagonists may mock conservative morals as some sort of superstition that has no real-life impact. The welfare state systematically exposes people to the temptation of believing that there are no time-tested moral precepts at all. Let us emphasize that the point of the preceding observations was not to attack welfare services, which are, in fact, an essential component of society. Neither is it here our intention to attack the notion that welfare services should be provided through government. The point is, rather, that fiat inflation destroys the democratic control over the provision of these services, that this invariably leads to excessive growth of the aggregate welfare system and to excessive forms of welfare, and that this in turn is not without consequences for the moral and spiritual character of the population. The considerations presented in this chapter are by no means an exhaustive account of the cultural and spiritual legacy of fiat inflation, but they should suffice to substantiate the main point that fiat inflation is a juggernaut of social, economic, cultural, and spiritual destruction. Our study seems to suggest that there is definitely something diabolical in fiat inflation, but we feel incompetent to deal with this question and leave its analysis for another time or for other scholars. It is certainly significant that a great poet such as Goethe would portray paper money as the creation of the devil.